thank you very much for coming out today. Uh, my name's Jim Lewis, welcome to CSIS. Uh, it's been a busy year for ICANN, it's been a busy year for internet governance, and it's gonna be a busy week for Rod Beckstrom, so we're especially pleased that he would take a little time out to come and talk to us on a topic that's, I think, close to my heart and probably close to his. But with that, let me turn it over to Rod. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, uh, CSIS. Uh, the Center for Strategic International Studies has been doing such important work for decades to promote greater international understanding and union around the world. And uh, particularly honored to address all of you today. I checked the list of attendees and I see we have all five regions of the world represented here. That is the ICANN, the internet regions, North America, South America, Europe, uh, Africa, uh, and also uh, Asia. So very honored to be with you here. We also, I wanna acknowledge the attendance uh, from the White House, State Department, OECD, Government of Australia and other governments around the world. Truly honored to be here with you and all of you from the private sector uh, as well as other nonprofit organizations. Uh, I have a great appreciation for the work that Jim has led here and uh, in, when he led uh, in particular the CSIS Commission on Cybersecurity for the 44th Presidency. I think that was very important seminal work that's made a contribution globally to better uh, international uh, understanding uh, on the internet and uh, commend particularly the report that was written um, uh, on securing cyberspace for the 44th presidency that's still often referred to. And that, that has contributed much to the global dialogue that's going on about the internet and about the future of the internet uh, and how it's used by mankind and used by all the different uh, aspects of society. Uh, we're here this week uh, to make an announcement or because of a significant change uh, 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 in our world of technology. And what is happening this week heralds a new era for the domain name system and it accomplishes a new milestone in the history of the internet. And that is namely the opening up of the new generic top level domain system of the internet in the third round and the most significant opening uh, in, in the history of the domain name system. So what's changing? And who decides what's changing? Well, the first context that I want to lay out, and I think applies well to this institution, is that the internet, as we know, was initially developed in the United States of America, and the internet was 100% American, and it is becoming 100% global. And what is happening this week facilitates that continued transition and change, which is for the betterment of the world and the betterment of mankind. Um, what the globalization is just one aspect of the program, but it's a critical aspect because when the domain name system was created, initially there were some top level domains that were, that were limited only to this national geography. Top level domains such as .gov and .mil come to mind. And the other ones that were established were uh, uh, operated uh, by operators uh, in this geography. And of course, ICANN has opened up the domain name system before, so there now are some other registries being operated around the world, like .asia, um, that is operated uh, out of Hong Kong uh, in China. And uh, so this is part of that continued move. Now, how was this developed, okay? And who decides? This change to the domain name system was developed by the global multi-stakeholder community of ICANN. And it follows on the historical trajectory that was established in the late 1990s when the first policy concepts were developed for the formation of ICANN and for the, the transferring of the coordination of the global domain name system from the United States to the world in a multi-stakeholder, multinational body headquartered in the United States, namely ICANN. And in those original policy documents, it stated that this new body, ICANN, should open up the top level domain space to provide consumers with more choice and to ensure that there's more competition in the domain name market space. Well, how has that worked out? We estimate that average prices of domain names in the generic top level domains have dropped 70% since ICANN's founding, 70% drop. 
That's a very significant wealth transfer to the benefit of consumers and, and users of the internet uh, around the world. Uh, this multi-stakeholder body uh, has different formalized components. There's three policy organs. There's a group called the Country Code Name Supporting Organization. So country codes are the operators of like .uk or .au or .ke for Kenya. These are the uh, country code registries of the internet. That community has over 100 members. It's called the CCNSO, and one of the founders of that community and our former chairman, uh, Peter Dingate Thrush, is here with us today. Um, we also have the generic name supporting organization, and that is a group of participants of domain name registries and registrars in the generic space. So when you think of .com or .net or .org, those are generic top-level domains. They don't pertain to countries. And so there's a whole uh, policy development body that includes registries, registrars, also civil so society uh, organizations, intellectual property constituency, which has very strong views and interests on the topic of new generic top-level domains. Uh, and that is the policy group out of the three that initiated the new generic top-level domain program. The third policy development organ is called the ASO, or Address Supporting Organization. That's for all the internet addresses in the world, IPv4 addresses and IPv6. There's five regions in the world. Each one has a regional internet registry, which is the community coordination policy body uh, that allocates internet addresses. So the ASO is also involved. So all ICANN policies start or are born in one of those three vehicles. This policy that's being implemented uh, this week was developed in the GNSO starting in 2005, approved in Paris in 2008 in a policy uh, uh, perspective, and approved by the board of ICANN to go into operations in June of last year, 2011, in Singapore. And that's how we develop our policies, by the way, which is around the world. Every year we have three big meetings. We call them public meetings. They rotate around the five regions of the world. And so they cycle systematically through North America, South America, Europe, Asia, and Africa. So the policy was developed. And when the board approved this program uh, in June of last year, uh, it was decided that the launch date would be two days from today. January 12th, 1201 UTC to be precise, which is equal to 7.01 p.m. tomorrow evening here in D.C. This new program will open. Um, when, you, when we talk about the Internet and we think about the Internet and its governance and in the context of, of this uh, solution within it, you know, we usually refer to the Internet as the Internet. But why do we call it the Internet? That suggests one thing. And we think of it as one thing. We refer to it as one thing. But if you think about what comprises the internet, it's actually millions of private networks and billions of privately owned devices, sometimes owned by governments as well, such as cell phones, uh, iPads, or tablets, PCs. And we have approximately two billion users in the internet today. And that's growing quite rapidly, particularly with the uh, advent and the acceleration of smartphones and tablets. We're very likely to add several billion users to that number over the next 20 years. Uh, and surveys around the globe show that 75% uh, of the people in the world have very strong opinions about how access to the Internet should be handled, which suggests the level of utilization is actually much higher than the number of devices and accounts might suggest, which makes sense when we think about families and, and communities. So the Internet has become very pervasive. But why do, we, why do we refer to the Internet as one place? It's really millions of private networks. And the answer is that there's three things that unify the Internet. And those three things have to be coordinated globally for the Internet to operate as a unified global whole. And those three things, and we've been referring to them in part, are domain names, network addresses or IP addresses, and the protocol and parameter registries, which are like technical settings and standards for the internet. Those three things, domain names, addresses, and the protocol and parameter registries are the only three things in the world that make the internet look like one place. The ICANN community and all the hundreds of organizations and more than 100 governments 
that are formally involved in ICANN through our governmental advisory committee are the stewards of those three resources that we call the unique identifiers of the internet. To keep the internet whole and not fractured, to not have multiple roots, to not have a fractured uh, uh, or blocked or filtered internet um, requires an enormous ongoing effort and collaboration of all those parties globally to keep that system working and to keep that system evolving so that it can meet the, the needs of mankind and our commerce and our society and our individuals. So that's what the multi-stakeholder model does. This program, the new GTLD program, then is an example of what that policy development process produces. And in the case of the new generic top-level domain program, as we mentioned, that started in 2005, 2006, there were more than, there were 45 public comment periods when anyone in the world, anyone in this room and anyone in the world could share their opinions, their thoughts, write papers, post them online, submit them on this program. There were more than 2,000 submissions over that period of time to help shape this program. The summary analysis of those suggestions is 1,400 pages long, to give you an idea. The ICANN meetings around the world now are attracting, on average, probably around 12 to 13, 1,400 people from around the world at each policy development, uh, the big meetings that we have, the public meetings. And there's many more people. You can, you can participate. At those meetings, by the way, the microphone is open. So there's many formalized sessions, there's many concurrent sessions going on, whether it's cybersecurity issues or law enforcement issues or intellectual property issues or addressing issues, there's many concurrent sessions. At many of those sessions, the microphone is open uniquely for anyone in the world to come up and speak and share their views. And that has been the case for six years in the development of this program, the new GTLD program. So ICANN is an international consensus-driven organization and it's committed to a secure and stable global unified internet. So we've talked a bit about the organization. Now let's talk a little bit more about this program. First let's talk about globalization. So where are the users of the internet today? Half of them, a billion, are in Asia. Approximately 500 million alone, 25 percent, are in China. And yet today in the internet, there's not a single generic top-level domain in Chinese characters or in Devanagari characters for the Hindu language or in Arabic characters. There's nothing in the generic uh, area. There are country codes, and we introduced internationalized domain names and country codes successfully starting in 2009. We have more than 20 countries represented in the root of the internet now with more than 30 internationalized domain name extensions. And that was a critical move in the internationalization of ICANN and of the internet domain name system. But this move is critical because it is the first time in history that an organization in China or in Beijing, I mean New Delhi, or Qatar, or the UAE, or another country can apply for a top-level domain name in their own language script. So it's, it's absolutely vital. And I've personally traveled through 27 countries in the last four months and stopped and met with the internet community, met with companies, nonprofits, governments in 16 of those in, in probably well over, I don't know, probably close to 200 meetings uh, over the past four months to talk about this program. And I can tell you that there are definitely parties that are interested in Beijing, in New Delhi, in Qatar, in the United Arab Emirates, and around the world in all five geographies. I was also in Sao Paulo, Brazil. There's interest around the world, and there's a sense from these users around the world that, that, that this is fair and this is right, that they should have this access to the internet. And I remember meeting with a, a minister in France last year, and she asked me the question. She says, why is this taking so long? When are you finally going to open the new GTLD program? Uh, and I say that because obviously we know there's a lot of controversy and there's a lot of parties that, that uh, are opposed to the program or aspects of the program they want to see changed. And that's a sign of a healthy multi-stakeholder model. The debate never stops. It's just like Congress 
or politics uh, here in the United States or anywhere else in the world. It goes on and on and on. And, uh, and certainly ICANN has been in the limelight uh, in the last, uh, well, over the whole period of this program, there's been a lot of interest, and certainly over the last few months, uh, intensive interest lobbying, uh, millions of dollars being spent in this city uh, by parties that wanted to share their views. Uh, parties, incidentally, who played very valuable roles in the development of this program, as this program has extensive intellectual property protections. We have intellectual property protections, uh, intellectual property experts on our board. We have uh, uh, great experts uh, in our community, not only in the intellectual property constituency itself, but across the community and other areas that have been deeply involved. And I'd say the, the greatest reason it's taken so long to develop this program was actually attention to intellectual property issues. Secondarily, I'd say probably attention to government uh, issues. Governments have been concerned about many geographic naming issues. What's the treatment of cities? What's the treatment of capital cities? What's the treat treatment of nat nation names, national names? What's the treatment of state names? And all these issues are very complex and difficult because they involve different treaties and different bodies of law around the world. Governments have also been uh, duly concerned about law enforcement issues and how do you increase the standards of information and support for law enforcement uh, uh, in the domain name system and particularly in new GTLDs. And this program clearly has more intellectual property protections by far than any previous GTLD program in ICANN's history. And, uh, and, and also, uh, better care and handling, uh, I think, on, on, um, on, on law enforcement issues. Uh, and again, of course, there's different constituencies out there. You also have a privacy constituency and civil rights and civil liberties that have different views and different set of needs and interests than, than law enforcement wise, uh, might. And that's a healthy tension, uh, much of which works through the ICANN community to grind out policies. Now, are those policies perfect? No, no policies are perfect. But for the sake of the global public interest, you have to decide when consensus policies are developed and they're well thought through and considered and key issues have been addressed, there comes a time to make the decision and to move forward. And the ICANN board made the decision to move ahead with this program formally in June of last year in Singapore and charged the organization with gearing up to handle all the technology needs, processing needs, contracting, arbitration processes, et cetera, to be prepared for a launch uh, on Thursday uh, of this week. So let's talk about uh, some of the enhanced uh, provisions in this program uh, to address intellectual property issues and, and so-called defensive registrations and other things. The first is, in this program, we're doing criminal background checks on the officers of applying organizations. And in fact, we have uh, communicated with Interpol and are taking some of their suggestions in how we identify the right parties to work with globally to engage those services. So we do background checks. Uh, we are also taking the list of all the strings that are applied for. So any, any top level domain name that's applied for around the world, we're gonna take all those applications. We close the window on April 12th. In early May, we're gonna publish that entire list. And anyone in the world, anyone in this room, and anyone in the world can go into any single application and state your opinions. State your support, state your indifference, state your concerns, whatever it might be, whatever your set of issues might be. Uh, in addition, and that period is open for 60 days. Also for 60 days, we have a special window for our governmental advisory committee. Those are the more than 100 governments that formally advise ICANN including I think all the governments in the room uh, today. Uh, and they have 60 days to give us early warning. And, that, and, and GAC advice is special in ICANN because we have different advisory committees, but when advice comes from the governmental advisory committee, the board is compelled to either accept that advice or if it rejects it, to state and explain the rationale why it's being rejected. And there's a very high standard of expectation and care that has to be given to all those what we call GAC recommendations. So the GAC has 60 days to issue a preliminary opinion on all those strings and flag any that they're concerned about. They still reserve the right to come back at any time in the future and express an objection, but it's part of the process that we establish to formalize government involvement and review of those strings. 
Then, for a seven-month period of time, anyone in the world who has an objection to one of the strings can actually file a formal objection, but you're going to have to pay for that. There'll be a loser pay structure, and there's four different types of objections that can be filed. They can be filed on the basis of intellectual property issues. So if someone applies for a name that looks like your trademark and they don't own the trademark, file an objection. There's a formal process. There will be independent experts that are independent of ICANN, uh, and all these mechanisms are defined in the applicant guidebook, the 300-page rule book for the program. Those experts will determine the winner and the loser in that objection process. If an applicant loses, they're gone. They've lost their application fee. They're out of the process. The application fee, incidentally, is $185,000. That sounds like a lot of money, but that's priced out to cover the criminal background checks, supporting the technology processes here, the public comment processes, the outsource processing of the applications, the development of the application processing system, uh, and many other checks that we have to do. Uh, it's priced at at break even. One third is a risk contingency because ICANN does face litigation and other risks. Uh, and if there's any surplus after the program is completed, the community will decide what's done with those funds because they're managed in a separate fund. They don't go into the ICANN general fund. So this is run on a pure break-even basis for the uh, benefit of the world. So coming back to the protections, there's those objections. So for seven months, you have an opportunity to file and start an objection, and then they'll run different courses of time depending on the nature of the objection and the time frame set by uh, those panel experts and the, and the processes that are, that are defined. Uh, the next thing that's very significant and innovative is a global trademark clearinghouse. So one of the problems in the domain name system today is that if you're a trademark holder, it, it's kind of hard to watch what's happening across 300 top-level domains in the world to see if anyone might be registering, you know, your domain name. And so that, that requires, you know, human effort and work. So the community and the intellectual property experts said, we can do better than this. Let's build a global database and allow any party that can provide the documentation that they have the right to a trademark or service mark to register that in a database and then get alerted if anyone in the world registers that at the second level for all of these new top-level domains. So let's say hypothetically we create 500 new top-level domains, you register your 10 trademarks in the system once. If anyone in the world tries to register one of your trademarks in those 500 new top-level domains, you'll get notified. Once you're notified, you can either communicate to the party directly and say, you know, cease and desist, you know, or, you know plead. And if they don't listen to you, you can file a complaint, a formal law, arbitration complaint under either what we call the UDRP, Uniform Dispute Resolution Process, which is the basic arbitration process for domain name disputes. It's used roughly 5,000 times a year today. And incidentally, in more than 80% of the cases, the party that applies wins in, in control of the domain name changes. Because usually parties will only apply if they've got a trademark or service mark and the other party doesn't. But the process works, and it's, and it's much less expensive than litigation or other uh, options like that. So UDRP is available, but some parties were concerned that's not fast enough because it can take uh, uh, some, quite some number of weeks to resolve these issues. So we developed a uniform rapid suspension system for very clear-cut cases, and those will be resolved uh, in a 21-day time period. Um, I believe is, is how we've structured that. So that's another protection. Yet, another, yet a further protection is what we call sunrise registration rights. So what's a sunrise? Well, think of a new top level domain appearing you know, on, the, on, on, on the horizon. It's, as it's rising, there's a period of time during which trademark holders have the right to register domain names before other parties do. So it's a period of time when only trademark and service mark holders will have the right to register domains. And that's just another protection mechanism that was sought uh, by the intellectual property uh, interests and in, in communities. And then finally, there's the, uh, something that we can think of as the nuclear option, okay? And that is called PDDRP, or Post-Delegation Dispute uh, 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 Resolution Procedure. What that means is if a new registry operator is demonstrated over time to allow or engage in abusive behavior that's not in the global public interest and that's not respecting the contracts and the policies of ICANN and the global internet community, we actually have the right to shut down or take back that registry. Uh, now, we would hope to never do that. And as you can imagine, that was a, a very you know, hard fought battle by members of the community. Um, 
Um, but it exists, it'll provide an incentive for good behavior because we don't want to see malicious conduct and behavior out there that's, that's not good for the users of internet. So let's talk about some of the positives. Okay, it's, it's easy to get focused on the negatives, right, in any policy discussion, and, and that's an important part of the policy design and shaping process. But what are some of the, the positive reasons that this program is moving forward besides the globalization? Another reason is just is innovation. You know, whenever you create new standards in the internet, whether you open up any key new technology and you create a standard, there tends to be innovation. Now, what is an innovation going to look like and where is it going to go? None of us know. That's why it's called innovation, because it's uncertain. It's about creativity. And we certainly have the impression that there's a lot of creative ideas that parties have out there and around the world that they're going to want to bring forward in this expansion of the new generic top-level domain space that we haven't seen in the past. And I think that's what makes the future so interesting. It's also what makes the Internet so exciting. So you work to design all the, the proper protections you can in a program, but you also have to remember there's very creative people out there who are not sharing their plans yet. There's actually a number that have been bubbling up in the last few days. If you read the Wall Street Journal article from yesterday uh, and other articles that are appearing, parties are beginning to talk about some of their plans for new generic top-level domains that they're going to be creating that weren't speaking before. And, and by the way, she's talking about, you know, in, 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 in numbers and I can't remember if I covered this, but we don't have a specific forecast of how big this round will be. We planned it on 500 applications. And having traveled around the world, I heard numbers as low as several hundred applications being forecasted by others. The highest number I ever heard was 4,000. Um, I don't know where it's going to come out. And I can doesn't care. Our goal is not to create any number of applications. Our goal is to serve the global public interest and to administer this program fairly and professionally for the benefit of global internet users while ensuring the security and stability of the global internet that's become so vital to so many aspects of our lives. We also think that very clearly this innovation will create new jobs. Uh, we don't know how many. We can look in the mirror a few years from now and see. But clearly new businesses are being formed, new companies are being formed, new service providers, new top level domain registries new registrars, so it is creating new opportunities in business and new jobs. And, you know, the reality is, is that great ideas don't last forever. So if you think of the domain name system, it may seem very familiar. You know, we think of .com, .net, .org. But the reality is that's what was created in the past. And it's important to open up to the world and to users around the world to see what they wish to create for the next uh, generation of the Internet domain name system. The uh, third benefit is competition, right? The reality is, is that not everyone has the domain name that they want today. And one of the reasons for that, by the way, is the fundamental mismatch between how the trademark system evolved and developed over time versus how the internet works. The trademark system is fragmented and divided by categories and geographies. So if you take the United States, we have over 40 different categories for filing trademarks. Okay? Different industrial categories. So the same name, exactly the same name or term, can be filed by different companies in different sectors. Now, take that issue and roll it around the world to all of your countries, and all countries around the world, so probably more than 150 have these regimes, and you're talking about well over 5,000 different entities that could have the rights to exactly the same trademark or term. The domain name system, on the other hand, has integrity and is unique. Every domain name is unique. So if you take example.com, there is only one example.com in the entire world. And that's why the ICANN policies and, and the, the work of our community is critical in coordinating the internet to maintain that integrity. So when someone sends you an email to your account, it gets to you and doesn't go to five other people in the world have cho that have chosen to use the same name that you have in a system that, that would lack integrity. So the domain name is unique and it has naming integrity, just like the addressing system. Addresses are unique and there's address integrity. And that's what keeps the global internet unified and keeps it working and scaling for the benefit of mankind. So there's always going to be a pressure between the trademark system, which is divided again by categories and geographies, trying to fit into a system where each term or string is unique. So you can imagine the competition for some of those strings. 
whether that's financial competition or policy competition or, or whatever it might be, there's a lot of heat. And that's a lot of some of the heat that you're, you're hearing, uh, I think, here in D.C. And, and other places in the, in the last few weeks. The fourth uh, uh, primary benefit is, is, is that relates to competition is consumer choice. So maybe you didn't get the domain name that you wanted because someone else with your family name grabbed it in 1993 or 1994. Most family names were grabbed by 95. Um, uh, in, 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 in the Western world. Uh, so you're going to have another you know, bite at that apple uh, with the creation of new generic top-level domains. Maybe you're a part of a different trade association or group or city or geography that's going to have a domain name, a top-level domain, where you can actually get the name that you want to have, whether you're an individual or a business. So that provides more uh, consumer choices. Now, some people ask us and they say, well, are these new TLDs going to be successful? Or how many are going to fail? Well, of course, you know, how do you define success and how do you define failure? Uh, and certainly, who will decide? Users of the world will decide. Organizations will decide what succeeds and what's not successful. ICANN's concern is not about the individual business, marketing, or organizational usage success of a top-level domain. It's that the global internet domain name system be secure and stable and reliable. And that's what the checks are in for the system. And then the community cares about protecting rights holders, such as trademarks that we discussed. So we'll see some successes. We'll see some failures. We'll probably see some innovations that we find it very hard to even think about today. Um, uh, certainly some things are predictable. I mean, having spent a week in Beijing about a month ago uh, and hearing that a number of parties will be applying for generic top-level domains for their equivalent of things like .gov and .com and .org, sounds like that's a reasonable. They might do that. We'll see. And make it clear, we have no opinion I can. I have no opinion as a CEO about anybody's concept or idea for a new TLD. We will take the applications and we'll process them fairly according to the rules. And uh, the final des decider on these will be the board of directors of ICANN, but they do not intend to weigh in on individual decisions. Uh, they intend to uh, accept the, the process that's handled. And I should mention our, our chairman, uh, Dr. Steve Crocker, is here with us today, um, uh, who leads the, the, the board. So again, if we look at ICANN, ICANN, uh, in a summary, is consensus-driven, focused on security and stability, and focused on the unified global internet. And this program has been developed to support all three of those. It was developed through a consensus policy development process through many hard fought battles over many years. Uh, it has an entire set of protections for additional security and stability that previous uh, GTL rounds, GTLD rounds did not have, such as support for DNSSEC support for centralized zone file backups uh, and other things. I, I won't geek out here and get into too many technical details, but there's additional security uh, protections. And clearly, it, it, it should serve to support the unified global internet by helping to meet the needs of internet users around the world who would like to have some of the same choices that people who live in this geography uh, enjoy today. So how is this internet going to look in five to 10 years? and the domain name system. I think we can say it's going to be more ubiquitous. There will be more domain names. There's going to be more devices. It's going to be more network addresses. It's going to be more global. The highest growth rate in the world uh, of internet uh, users is in Asia. It's a very significant growth. It's going to be more diverse. You're going to see more different tools, applications, devices, more different domain names. You're going to see more different languages in domain names, and you're going to see less Latin as a, as a portion of that mix, I would predict. And so it's going to look more like the world, and it's going to look less like one individual country. Uh, and I think that that's a good thing for the internet. So I also think if we meet together here at CIS in two years and have this discussion, and then we look back on this program, you know, today many people ask the question, why are you doing this program? Okay. And I think in two years' time, a lot of people look back and say, how could you not have done this? How could you not have opened up the internet to this innovation and to this international participation? But that summarizes my comments. I'm thrilled to be here with you today, and maybe we can move to a question and answer. Thank you very much.
it occurs to me that I didn't introduce Rod when I came in, but I just assumed everyone knew who he was. I mean, he is a global internet leader, and if you don't know who he is, see me afterwards, and uh, we can. But with that, I think what we'd like to do is, if you have time, take, take a few questions. Uh, there are microphones, if you can wait for them, and if you could please introduce yourself uh, when you ask your question. Do we want to go ahead and start? We've got one. Oh, hi. <laughs> Yeah. Think it's you should my wife. Okay, thank you. I'll just grab to the point. Thank you. Hi, this is Juliana Grimal with National Journal. Now, you say that the, the process came about through consensus and the bottoms up, you know, consensus driven process ICANN is supposed to make decisions by. But you have, you know, can you respond to your critics who argue that you didn't follow this process, uh, given that so many trademark holder, holders have cried foul and have called for you to delay it? Can you just respond to that? Sure. The uh, policies were developed by the GNSO, the Generic Name Supporting Organization, and it took three years of hard work of that group, which itself has a complex structure, and one which evolved again recently. Our multi-stakeholder model's gone through two significant evolutions in its design over just 12 years, so that our design's quite uh, or organic and evolving. Uh, it was developed through that process and then uh, reviewed in depth by our board, which is a multi-stakeholder consensus body itself. The board members are, are elected by those policy development organs that I mentioned. They're also appointed from the advisory committees, such as the Root Server Advisory Committee that engaged in these policies, the Security and Stability Advisory Committee, uh, which is security experts from around the world, the At-Large Advisory Committee, which includes more than 150 civil society groups around the world. Um, and of course, the Governmental Advisory Committee, the GAC. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so all of those bodies weighed in. And in fact, if you look at, look at our engagement with the GAC on this, on this policy development alone, we, for the first time in ICANN's history, did a formal pre-consultation just on this program in March of last year in Brussels with more than 40 countries represented. And uh, I think we had 18 out of 22 ICANN board members and liaisons. And we worked through 80 requested changes that came from the governments of the world through the GAC, and we were able to accommodate well over 70 of those. So, um, it, it, which is just another touchstone example. Now that does not mean in a multi-stakeholder model, reaching consensus is not unanimity. And this program was not approved with a unanimous vote of the ICANN board. The previous round, I know round one was in 2000. The uh, first round of new GTLDs had a unanimous board vote. Uh, this one had a dominant majority, um, but uh, so there's every, you know, it, and, it's, and it's all online, it's all documented, it's, it's all transparent, and, and the reality is, is uh, you know, some of the parties that, that are issuing complaints right now issued letters as a part of this program, and their changes were accommodated, okay? So if you find a place where a change was not accommodated, you're probably going to find there was a group of parties that had, had a different view. So clearly a rich consensus project uh, process. Again, no pro, uh, uh, process is perfect. And by the way, this process can still change or the program can still change because the board of ICANN and ICANN as an organization reserves the right to change this program in the future. And every applicant that applies for a top level domain has to understand that. And we need to do that for the security and stability of the internet because we, we don't know what set of issues can develop tomorrow. But was there any reason why you had to stick by this particular date? I mean, you had key members of Congress also saying, hey, slow this down, why not delay it, answer some more of these questions. There, there, there was a date approved by the ICANN board. Um, the global internet community, many uh, participants feel they've waited for many years already. Uh, and there were no reasons given for the delay. Um, there's no new information that's come in in the last few months. It's the same set of arguments, most of which have been heard for up to five and six years. So same set of issues. And again, it's, it's all a balancing equation. It's, it's just like, you know, Congress, you know, finally you know, enacts legislation or any other legislative body. That doesn't stop the lobbying of special interests to say, that wasn't fair legislation. It's wrong. You should change it. You should reinterpret it. I, I think it's the same thing uh, here. Uh, Tom. Ed, I won't stand up so I don't block a shot here. Uh, you said that this debate uh, has been healthy. I'm wondering if you want to qualify that uh, in any way, or is, is there any way in which the debate has not been healthy? And I ask that because, uh, of course, there's been controversy 
that the internet uh, and ICON and ICANN in particular is too dominated by the United States, by the U.S. government. And here, uh, the way that you explained the evolution uh, of this program, it appears to have a lot of international support, but has run into a lot of criticism in the U.S. Congress, even from the Federal Trade Commission. You got members of Congress saying that the Department of Commerce should order you basically to, to slow down. Does criticism coming from within Washington like this make it more difficult for you to say that ICANN is not dominated by Washington? Yes. I mean, you know, ICANN is a global institution. And it says that in our bylaws. And it says it even in the, the white paper and green papers that were developed, a joint effort by the Department of Commerce and the White House that helped shape us in the, initially, that we must be a global institution. So yes, there's a natural tension. Uh, and, and that's why it's all the more important that we be true to the global public interest and not the interest in, in any one national geography. Now, having said that, I want to recognize there have been concerns expressed from uh, trademark and business interests from around the world and, and different trade associations and other geographies. It hasn't been limited to North America or DC. It's certainly been focused here, I'd say, over the last uh, month. We've received a lot of attention. So, But I, I think even that's healthy, because even the, the debating and engaging in these issues is leading to a lot better understanding of ICANN. I mean, I, ICANN is a complex organism. I mean, we're a multi-stakeholder body with all these interlocking parts that work together and, you know, and, what, and how do you develop consensus on the internet? But the same tr is true, by the way, of the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, that critical internet organization that defines most of the standards of the internet and the ones that, that we seek to follow uh, as an organization. So uh, a lot of pressure, a lot of tension, and, and, and it, it forces the challenge for ICANN to grow up and decide what it is. Is ICANN a global organization? Or is ICANN going to be a national organization with global outreach? And I can tell you, under my leadership, certainly, and under Steve's leadership on the board, ICANN is a global organization that also respects its understanding and agreements with the United States government. Randy Bachman at FCC. Um, Jeff Moss addressed the FTC letter and said most of the things that they said were either unfounded or addressed by some of your remediation process. Um, one of the things that I didn't see, um, even though you mentioned the, the trusted trademark route, is no mention of the trusted route for domain names and IP addresses. Are you planning on including that in as well or not? Sure. Uh, let me um, first respond. And, and that's I'm, in, I'm, in reference to RPKI. Yeah. I, I'm not familiar with the comments you've, you've made about Jeff Moss, so I'm, I'm not going to uh, comment on those right now. I, I will say that we're examining the FTC letter in depth that we received. Well, I, I think you've addressed most of them. The one that I hadn't seen was on a trusted route of IP addresses. Oh. Um, that is certainly not part of the new GTLD program, um, not. Okay. and and so I think that would have to work through a different policy so development. I did hear process. that you were going to include um, encouraging people to be part of DNSSEC. Uh, it's required. It is required. Uh, it's required for the registries to support DNSSEC, which then means, so if you're a top-level domain, you have dot example, then anyone that registers at the second level should have the choice to turn on DNSSEC because you're going to support it. You will have signed what we call signed but you, you, You've looked at the names, not the numbers. Um, correct. This is, a, this is a change to the domain name aspect of the system. We, we have also specified in the program that all the registries have to support both IPv4, Internet Protocol 4, and IPv6. Um, the, the, uh, I, I think that the discussion about um, the the block of internet addresses or at the root of addresses and, and how that's secured. That is an ongoing technical discussion, as you know, in the IETF and other bodies. Once I think the IETF comes up in the Internet Architecture Board with their set of guidelines for doing that, the next step becomes how does ICANN look at those standards and look at policies to, uh, to support them. So it's an important effort, and we appreciate your support for that. Thank you. Hi, Rob Kimmer. I'm a trademark and copyright attorney with Raider Fishman and Grower, and I'm in the business of protecting clients' trademarks and brand names. Um, we recently did one of the first triple X uh, rapid evaluation service takedowns, and, mm -hmm. and probably in the world, and okay. won it, uh, and it went very fast. Like you said, 21-day mm -hmm. process, even through the holidays. Uh, is the 
process for the GTLD going to be set up similarly? And is this eventually maybe going to be rolled out to other top level domains? I thought it was a very effective process uh, in, as an alternative to a UDRP. I'm, I'm glad to hear it work. Jamie, are you in the room? Uh, Jamie <laughs> Hedlund is our VP of Gov Affairs and an intellectual property expert. I, are the mechanisms the same? Okay, it's a mic coming, Jamie. If you can start from from uh, sorry. So uh, ICM, which runs Dot Triple X, has their own policies, uh, and we and they developed those independently uh, from the new GTLD program. The URS was, as Rod said, was developed under the uh, the, the uh, implementation of the of the new GTLD program, um, and uh, and applies to uh, top level domains that are uh, approved in uh, through the program. Uh, whether it, uh, and so it doesn't apply to existing top level domains, um, whether that is to happen in the future will depend on, on the community um, moving toward, um, toward that objective. Thank you. Actually, you can point, you don't need my help, do you? No, you can point to it, you don't need my help. Uh, Trina right there. All right. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dan Jaffe from the Association of National Advertisers. I was just wondering, you seem to be glossing over uh, some of the level of criticism that has uh, been coming out. That, uh, the FTC didn't just say that there were some problems, but they said that the chairman said that uh, rowing this out this way uh, would create a potential disaster uh, for business and consumers. It uh, also, in that report, uh, talked about the ICANN Commission Who Is Review Team, which stated that very real truth that the current system is broken and needs to be repaired. Uh, the IGO also stated that their names, this is the UN, these are international organizations, the UN, the WHO, uh, NATO, uh, and uh, more than tw 28 other organizations also thought that this rollout was, uh, was premature. Uh, the uh, GAC, which pro provided 12 proposals to protect the system from internet uh, crime, uh, said that only three of those proposals had even been looked at and that none of them had been carried out. These sound like very serious uh, concerns when you're rolling something out that is going to fundamentally change uh, the running of the Internet. What are you going to do to try to meet some of these concerns? Or are these uh, concerns uh, s old stories that don't really need any real concern now? Sure. Thank you for sharing that. Um, in fact, I'm very proud of the, the work that the Who Is Review team has done. That Who Is Review team was formed as a result of the affirmation of commitments that we signed with the Department of Commerce on September 30th of 2009 that changed the oversight uh, and reviews of ICANN from the U.S. Department of Commerce to being done by the world. And, 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 and groups that are comprised of different stakeholders from around the world. And I'm the co-selector for all of those teams, and I really appreciate their hard work. And I think there is a lot more work to be done on who is. Uh, who is a really tough problem. You've got law enforcement constituencies with a very important set of concerns and issues, and then you've got uh, civil society groups and privacy uh, uh, parties that have very different uh, views as well. And trying to find the, the right middle ground, I think, is one of the great and important challenges we have as an organization and more work has to be done there. Uh, and a lot of work is being done right now, as we discussed uh, in our most recent meeting in Senegal when we met with the Governmental Advisory Committee, and they shared their view that, that uh, I think roughly you know, three of the concerns had, uh, were in the process of being addressed, but they were concerned about other concerns they'd identified, that we've uh, initiated a review of our fundamental contracts with the registrars. The registrars are parties like GoDaddy or anyone that you register a domain name with, you go through a registrar to register in a registry for the generics. The country codes are, are different. Uh, and we, but we have contracts with the registrars in the generic space, just like we have contracts with the registries. We are seeking, uh, at this time, we're in the process of detailed contract negotiations with the registrar constituency to change and amend those contracts to provide uh, better who is protections. And we're very much hopeful, uh, and I know it's something that, that uh, Dr. Steve Crocker, as our chairman, cares strongly about and has shared his, his support for the evolution of, uh, and I, I've been 
very concerned about since I came in with my own background in law enforcement and cybersecurity. Uh, so I think we'll see some progress there, hopefully by their Costa Rica public policy meeting. It's our next meeting in March. We invite all of you to join uh, in Costa Rica. And I think that's probably when there will be uh, in, in depth next level debate discussion on when the, where the RAs go. So a lot more work needs to be done. And I think that there's other parties now that are proposing uh, new ideas uh, they want to consider on defensive, uh, to prevent defensive registrations. Uh, so ICANN's an open community driven process and we seek to, to follow that process. Thank you. Okay, I think we have four questions just out of time. Can we get the one up in front of you? And I'll try to answer them yeah. with brevity as well. Thank you. Gravity or brevity? <laughs> <laughs> a little both. of each may both. fit I'll, this I'll try for both. <laughs> My name is Martin Apple. I'm with the Council of Scientific Society Presidents. Um, because of your background, I would like to know how you have seen the filling of the holes of the Swiss cheese of security and uh, what you think the current state is and how much it has changed from what you're doing. Sure. I, I think that... Uh, we'll, we'll that, that is the, you know, the mother of all questions. I mean, that's a huge question. Security is so complex. I think, it, you know, as I say sometimes, you know, who's an Internet security expert when it's almost impossible to truly secure anything that's attached to the Internet? So uh, it, it's, Internet security is a great challenge of our time, and it's something we all have to work on together. The role that ICANN plays that's really important is that ICANN is a bit like Switzerland in terms of neutrality. We are the neutral grounds where every single country and territory in the world link and have some level of work together to keep the domain name system going. Everyone from the OECD countries to Northern Korea, Syria, Iran, these countries in many cases are members of our government advisory committee. We welcome them. All of them we have operating contacts with because we have to coordinate the operations of the root zone of the internet through our IANA function. So we work with everyone in the world. We maintain that neutrality. Uh, you, can, you might read some interesting stories uh, in the Conficker case of the, the role that ICANN played to help link together 100 countries around the world to, for collaborative efforts to combat an extremely pernicious botnet. And we were able to do that because of our neutral position. Now, when you're that neutral, there's other things you can't do. And that's fine. That's appropriate. So I think we have a role. I'm not going to pine overall on whether the Internet's getting more secure or less secure. Uh, we've enhanced the technology for the domain name system by, by cryptographically signing the root of the Internet with DNSSEC. We have uh, uh, more than 60 or 70 top-level domains cryptographically signed with DNSSEC now. Those signings are going well. Adoption slow, though. At the second level, adoption slow. And uh, the adoption by users is slow, so we really need the help of everyone in this room, people in government and private industry, to advocate DNSSEC, which prevents man-in-the-middle attacks, basically. So that when you click on a domain name or type a domain name in your browser, you actually get to that site and someone else can't jump in the middle, intercept your request, and send you false data and fool you and dupe you out of information and defraud you or steal your money. So it's, it's DNSSEC is one critical piece of internet infrastructure. What the gentleman mentioned uh, from the FTC and, and, and adding security to the addressing system is another key component that must be done. And it's, uh, the work is underway, but working these through standards bodies and through building international consensus takes time. So more, more work to be done. We hope that we're contributing. Uh, well, we've got three here and then Diane there. So why don't we do those three and then move to Diane. Is that okay? And please remember to introduce yourself. Uh, yes, I'm uh, Judy Harris with Reed Smith. I'm a lawyer and unfortunately I think like one, so forgive me for that. But I believe, Mr. Beckstrom, that you were an official of the United States government before you joined ICANN. And, um, here in the United States, as you know, we have a rulemaking process and an agency that's going to make policy has a very specific process they follow and they solicit comments and then they make decisions based on those comments. And there is a recourse to the Court of Appeals if, sure. um, if there's a belief that the decisions that were made, the policies that were put in place, were, quote, arbitrary and capricious and not in keeping with the uh, comments that were filed. So my question is, and forgive my ignorance on this point, but you've talked a lot about the ability to write letters, you, you've talked about the open process you had for people submitting comments, you've talked about the ability that people are going to have to submit reactions mm -hmm. when the applications are. 
Um, does ICANN have any obligation to um, do more than listen? Is there any obligation to demonstrate that um, your decisions were in fact based on the preponderance of the evidence in the record? And if so, is there any recourse to anyone anywhere in the world to, uh, to challenge that finding? Sure, thank Thanks. you. If I simplify your question, it has two key pieces. I mean, is there a formalized policy development process? You know, I think it's kind of one question. And then secondly, are, are there review processes and procedures to appeal decisions even by the board of ICANN? And the answer is yes on both. Structures are a little different than in the, the U.S. government. Of course, they differ according to probably some of the departments and agencies and, and under, different, uh, under different authorities and titles. In ICANN, there is a formal policy development process. It was recently revised, and, and new revisions were just approved by the board of directors of ICANN. As I mentioned, there were 45 public comment periods uh, in the development of just this program. Just this one program had 45 different formal open public comment processes. Now, let's say what happens if the ICANN board makes a decision someone thinks is wrong? This has happened. And, in, and there's an independent process called an independent review panel that, can, uh, that are arbitrators that can review any decision by the ICANN board. And we had this case with uh, X. So the ICANN board voted down X because they felt the application did not meet some of the criterion. Um, the, the party that applied for that top level domain, disputed it and filed the first formal complaint under an independent review panel. And that took a considerable period of time to work through, I wanna say years, some people in the room know exactly you know, how many months or years. We certainly spent millions of dollars on that effort and we lost. All right, when we lost by the way, and my general counsel called me on a Friday afternoon or evening in California said, I, can't believe, I cannot believe this, we just lost the independent review panel decision. I said, good, help me tweet it right now. You know, can we publish this document? And he said, wow, I hadn't thought of that. I'm like, I want it published. He goes, well, we got to redact it first. I said, put your team on redacting it right now. I want it up on the web. You're helping me write a tweet right now that we just lost the decision. So that my tweet went out within minutes of me learning of that decision. Um, and we lost it. Then the board reconsidered the decision, laid out the process for reevaluating the decision with the community, took public comment on the process for reconsidering the decision, public comment in, in some, in, uh, I believe, in some different steps. And in the end, we ended up approving it. The board changed the decision. The board did not have to change the decision, by the way. The independent review panel forced a reconsideration. The reason for that is in part a legal reason. The board of ICANN is the fiduciary, fiduciary for making decisions for the organization. And it's not possible to have those reverted by an outside body, I believe, in, uh, under, under California law. So you've answered one question that they don't have, to, uh, that, that nobody has the power to force them to, to revert their decision. That's and for the board overall. But, but my first question, I think, was yeah. does ICANN have an obligation not only to take in comment, but to uh, make decisions based on the preponderance of the, I, I understand you're never going to have perfect consensus, or yeah. can you, could you choose to make your own decisions and ignore all those comments? The, the ICANN board, as fiduciaries of the organization, has the responsibility to make decisions in the global public interest. And we reaffirmed that responsibility when we signed the affirmation of commitments uh, with the Department of Commerce. That means at the end, the board must do what they believe is for the highest good of the global public interest. And that was certainly the litmus test on this program and the reasoning and the debates and discussions that we went through as a board in reaching the decision. Okay. Um, I think we have one, do you have time for two more? Uh, Absolutely, yeah. Okay, we have one, uh, we have, well, we have three more. Uh, go ahead. Certainly, this will be very brief. Um, and just, uh, of course, I'm Amy Moshoir with Reed Smith. And just a moment ago, you were talking about the complexities of security. And I quite um, appreciate the discussion of DNSSEC. And I think that is one item that will help. But going back to the who is problems, that's a problem that isn't very complicated. And it's a problem that has been around since 2002 when OECD had issued warnings about the fact that, that the who is system was woefully inaccurate and contained a myriad of errors. And in 2009, when law enforcement had recommendations in Seoul, and there have, uh, there have been many intermediary 
ma many intermediary decisions and, and issues regarding who is. Currently, we have all of this talk, mm -hmm. none of the law enforcement recommendations developed, and we still, on a thick who is registries, have registrations to Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, God, you name it. So specifically for those types of registry errors that, that could be easily screened out by a simple database query. I mean, is this even something that you propose to do or? Sure. Well, let me say, I invite you to step into the room, and I can, and maybe you do in the community, pull in the privacy groups, civil rights and civil liberties, law enforcement, registries, registrars, and then come out and tell me that this is easy and there's a, group, a set of recommendations everyone can agree upon because I haven't seen it, okay? Now, by the way, I don't develop policy. Well, I contribute as, you know, I support the policy development process as a CEO, and it's very important. And one of the key things I focused on as CEO is not trying to steer policies of ICANN, but in trying to tune up the policy development process and support organizations so we don't have an organizational skew. But going back to the, the stakeholders that you had named, the First Amendment constituency, the privacy constituency would be worried about proxy registrations where they're anonymous. Mm -hmm. Law enforcement would be worried about screening out these types of Mickey Mouse. If you're going to start reasoning this out, I say, come, come, please do it. Please help get to a, the, the community get to a consensus position because I think progress does need to be made. By the way, I agree with you that progress can be made. I agree with you there's some middle ground that can be found. I've got to say, having watched the, the battles go on and the, the positioning and the lobbying and the different aspects, I've never seen a group merge out of the room and say, you know, we've got it. It's really simple. You know, it's, it's all right here. You know, if they come out with different versions or say, well, I like that and I don't like that and I'll never live with that. So there's some pretty strongly held opinions. I do think that for, you know, what does ICANN live on? ICANN lives on the trust of the parties that we work with on the Internet globally. And we have to be fair and we have to be respected and we have to act in a trustworthy way fashion. And that means that we've got to keep pushing on these kinds of issues to enhance things like who is, even when it's easy for everything to get ground down and stuck. And I think that that's, that is part of the value that clearly the Board of ICANN adds. And I think as CEO, I've tried to add value in basically unsticking things at times. So I agree with you, it should be done. I don't think it's simple. But if you think it's simple, write it up. Get everyone on board. We had, we had one uh, right behind. By the way, I'm not so sure the God one is fake. So. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Joe George Marks. Burns. You know, he's got to register something. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joe Marks from Government Executive Magazine. You talked about um, national governments being one of the biggest, likeliest purchaser of these new top-level domains. And there are also many, uh, the .gov and a number of national governments are trying to tear down and rationalize their web presences right now. I'm mm -hmm. wondering if you can talk about how you expect this expansion of top-level domains to change the way governments manage their web presences. Sure. The, uh, first, I mentioned some, you know, some geographies where there seems to be an interest in creating local equivalents and local language scripts uh, for things like .com, .gov, .org. We'll see what actually happens. Um, one of the ways, uh, you know, a lot of governments will look at the issue of, you know, how do they create higher security zones or higher security networks or multiple different higher, you know, uh, security zones and, and, and how they do that. Some of those are relating to this. Most of the government interests we're seeing in the program that I've heard about on the Global Roadshow we've done are by cities, very strong interest by a lot of cities around the world uh, in, in all five geographies, uh, and also by states in some geographies, not in all geographies, but uh, interest by states. So I, I think you'll certainly see cities, you'll th uh, certainly see states, and I know some of the city CIOs are struggling with the issues of thinking, oh, okay, how do we manage this new top-level domain? Who do we let in? Do we want it to be open to everyone or do we want to have some quality control? But as soon as you do quality control, you're doing editing and you're doing choosing and you raise a lot of very difficult issues. So it, it's going to be, this is an area of innovation I think will be uh, quite interesting. Uh, one more? Last call? No? Well then, let me ask you to join me in thanking Roger. Thank you all very much. Thank you.